uh, Robert Williams, uh, who's, uh, who passed, what was the exact date that he passed? September 30th, and uh, because of COVID and such like and things, and it just it weren't, it, we're not able to do a memorial service, so we incorporated it in the service tonight. And so I'm glad that you came, and you can just worship with us. I'm going to preach here in just a little bit, but let's let's sing uh, a shelter in the time of the storm. We all stand, and uh, as I said a moment ago, death and life are in every service. We hope people that come in dead and trespasses will receive Christ and be made alive, quickened. Let's sing. All right. The Lord, our rock in hell, we hide a shelter in a time of storm. So scare whatever hell be tied, a shelter in a time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is Sheltered in the time of storm, a shade by day, defense by night, a sheltered in a time of storm. No fears are harm, no foes are bright, a sheltered in the time of storm. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock. videos of where there's tsunamis and storms that come and they hit and they and the flood waters are coming and at that very moment nobody's thinking about what they're going to eat that night or what they're going to put on or if they're going to save the cat or the dog or if the uh you know if the furniture is going to get wet you just think about saving your own life and uh, really every service ought to be that way we come in here and we put all that aside and just make sure we get to that rock that get to that rock in a weary land. And so uh, I'm glad I found that rock, aren't you? Or maybe more accurately, the rock found me. Amen. So uh, I'm glad I'm on the solid rock in which I stand. Let's pray tonight. And I do ask for your prayers for my Aunt Frances. And and uh, she's going to be staying here for a little while and keep mom company. And they're going to cook and cook and cook. And we're going to gain weight. And we're going to, uh, we're going to, yeah, we're gonna just have a good. Maybe they'll fish too, and teach Junior how to fish and all that. All they just we'll just maybe we'll do all that stuff. So uh, let's pray together. Would we for Miss uh, Aunt Francis and the rest? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for being our rock in a weary land. And Lord, tonight as we come to worship you and honor you, and uh, also remember uh, my uncle, a friend, a husband, uh, Lord, a relative tonight. Uh, we want to thank you for his life and Lord thank you for what he meant to us all and I do pray that you would uh, encourage those that might be watching via Facebook family members uh, whether watching now or later and I pray God that uh, through this time of service uh, this closure for the family that uh, we all in here all listening and hearing and watching that uh, we would be doing some business with you Lord getting to that rock uh, that solid rock in which we can stand and not, not live our life on sinking sand. Lord, do that work in our life. Do that work here tonight in this service. May you be glorified and may we be comforted uh, during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn around and wave at each other if you would just for a moment. And...
right. What, what, this is what we're going to do tonight, and uh, it's kind of unusual, uh, how the service and such, but uh, uh, we're going to sing another, or they're going to sing, somebody's going to sing, and we'll take up the evening offering, and then we'll, we'll have the, the service. I'll tell you a eulogy about, a little bit about my Uncle Robert. There's a few pictures that will be flashing here in just a little bit. We just have a couple up here as well, uh, and, uh, and then I'll preach, and then we'll go eat some food, Amen. That'll be all right and fellowship a little bit. But uh, uh, right now we just need to think about, I want you to think about life and death and think about he was 87, is that correct? 86 years old. And uh, I will say this is that he had been sick for a little while, but he ended up dying of a perforated bowel that they found two hours, but they found the spot before, two hours where he died. So he lived a long life, but you just don't know. You just don't know when... You're going to die. You got to be prepared. It could be tonight. Uh, I know Ronnie didn't. He lived, but he didn't know he was going to fall off that roof. And uh, so that those things can happen. We don't never know when our hour is going to. Get, so make sure we're ready. Amen. Go ahead. I want y'all to back me up, the girls. Oh. clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day that will be what a day And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. take the offering up at the end of service but I, I wanted to uh, just tell you this uh, it, it is a sad day when you have to uh, make closure and there's a, a memorial service but I, I, I failed to tell you and I think it was providential hindrance so that we could brighten the service up just a little bit that Phyllis's uh, dad Buford who was 98 years old got saved so, amen. he got saved and, uh, and what was also special was that his grandson, or great-grandson, I guess, uh, <laughs> grand grandson led him to the Lord. And so that's, that's just a rejoicing time. Uh, uh, I, I want to take a moment and tell you a little bit about my Uncle Robert. Uh, 
Uh, first, they, uh, Aunt Fran and Uncle Robert were married 36 years, and I remember when I was a teenager, he, he, he collected and sold classic cars. And everywhere they went, he bought a car. I remember, I, I do remember for some reason, he'd have a wad of cash. I mean, that thing, because he was, we, he was from that generation that you dealt with cash, I reckon. And, uh, and when we lived in Raleigh, he came, when they came to see us in Raleigh, uh, we went somewhere, I don't know what it was. I was a teenager, I was about 16 years old. And he bought like, a, I would say, I don't know, 77 Buick, one of those big long Buicks, it was convertible. And it was, it was, uh, uh, it was a convertible. And he bought that thing and he let me drive it. And boy, my friend Anthony, I thought we were the big dogs. We drive, we were just cruising down in that big old, that big old convertible. And, and uh, Robert, uh, Uncle Robert was a, a kind of a firm guy. He wasn't a, a joker, you know, he could cut up whatever. So you serious, so you always, you, he was in the military, he was Korean War, he was a airplane mechanic. So maybe the military did it to him that he was more serious when it comes to that. But uh, um, he was very patriotic. He loved, he loved our country. And, uh, um, uh, one thing I talked with Aunt Frances about his early years is that he, he was in church and uh, uh, being in church, uh, some things happened. He was actually a deacon in church. And so uh, being a deacon in church, uh, uh, some things happened. And you know, things happen in church all the time, don't they? And what had happened was that uh, it, it kind of threw him into where he wasn't in church like he was supposed to uh, for a long time. And uh, uh, that was unfortunate. I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. But uh, um, they were married 36 years. Uh, they, they had uh, one girl, Jana, and a boy, uh, Fred. Uh, Jana is passed, and, and Fred, uh, where does Fred live? He lives in, uh, he lives somewhere. So uh, we, <laughs> he loved dogs. Last dog that he blessed his wife with was uh, some type of sheep herding dog that weighed about 1,000 pounds, I think. I don't know, I'm exaggerating, but that was a big, it was a what? A Great Pyrenees. Y'all know what that is? Oh, oh uh, uh, Kelly out there says, oh yeah, glory, hallelujah. But I remember mom talking about that dog, the, the dog come in the house and the dog would, was that the dog that would herd you? It's a herder dog. And so mom's like trying to go to the kitchen is herding, you're herding her into the living room and pushing her into the living room. <laughs> it a, he loved dog like a lot of uh, husband-wife relationships. One of them loves them, one of them tolerates them. Amen. And uh, that was the relationship. So, so what was his name? Holly, uh, she, she, her name, she's at a good home now, right? <laughs> She's in a good home. Uh, but Uncle Robert loved food. He loved traveling. They traveled all over the, all over the world, really country. And, and um, he wouldn't eat out much, kind of like me growing up, because in the Robson, that's her maiden name, they can cook. Mm -hmm. Amen. So uh, he would eat, 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 and they, they, eat, they ate well. They ate really, really well. And uh, uh, they do have two grandkids, uh, and that's a blessing. But I, I wanted to, to mention um, about Robert in, in the last days, like I said, he, he knew he was sick. He knew something was wrong. He was stubborn, like most men, and he, you know, it'd be all right. He, he felt like he lived the full life. He did read the Bible regularly, not daily. Um, and I did not know him personally on that level to distinguish, but that, that's not the place for this. But one of the things that I wrote down was it, uh, his last words were, it's okay. And... Uh, one thing that you can draw uh, from that, you can speculate. One thing you can speculate too is that Aunt Frances said every, through when he was in the hospital those days that he was, he, he was thanking everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I can surmise from that that that's someone that understands the need, knowing that he's about to exit this world and he's going into another world. And um, God answered Aunt Francis' prayer, but he didn't suffer. Is that uh, he needed to be lifted up in bed or whatever, or you moved him to his side and, and kind of rolled him over, and God took him like that. He was gone in the moment. We are hoping that he'd go get out of the hospital, but it didn't happen. And so we're here today, and, and uh, uh, we're celebrating the life of, of, of Robert A. Williams, and uh, I, I'm thankful that I had I got the, to meet him. He has been in the church several times over the years, and uh, uh, he he lo like I said he loved cars. Now he did insult me last time he was here. He did he did he insulted me. He didn't know he did, but he said I'll give you I think eight hundred dollars for that Honda. 
<laughs> I said, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> I think he said it to mom, to me, or whatever, but it was like, I wanted 1200 or whatever. But he said, well, I got to do this, got to do that. He was a wheeling dealer. So now I kind of wish I did sell it to him. You know, just, but you're driving it now. So you have no, nothing to go. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, think about life. Young people, I want you to think about death. I want you to think about we're not going to We're not going to be on this earth forever. And we've got to make plans. This life is the preparation for eternal life. And uh, some are well prepared and others are not. And so before I preach, I want Leslie to sing a song that uh, I don't know if you haven't sung it here yet, have mm-hmm. you? You have, but it, it's a, it's, you can get the tissues. Get, get the <laughs> tissues. Because it, it's talking about the other side. The sun always shines, no minutes, no hours, there's no such thing as time, where the streets are paved with gold, and you never grow old on the other side, on the other side. Everybody sings There's miles and miles of flowers And lots of pretty things Where the sky's the perfect blue And everything looks brand new On the other side Well, I've never been to heaven I didn't know what it was like But God let me have a glimpse In my dream last night And I could see you smiling You were looking right at me And in the first time in a long time On your face I saw some peace And I knew everything was going to be all right on the other side. On the other side, do you ever see me cry? Do you know how much I miss you? Wish I could have said goodbye. Oh, just one more, I love you. Am I really getting through on the other side? Well, I've never been to heaven. I didn't know what it was like. God let me have a glimpse in my dream last night and I could hear you laughing you were looking right at me and in the first time in a long time on your face I saw some peace and I knew everything was going to be all right no No more sad goodbyes on the other side. On the other side. On the other side.
You ready to go? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and it says, It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. We'll be in John chapter 11. James 4, 14 says, Whereas you know not what shall the morrow be on the, be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. With the certainty of death uh, for us all, all, all of us need to prepare. Some uh, will prepare as close as they can per God's instruction for death. Uh, many of you in here will, will do as much as you possibly can to prepare for your death as far as being right with God, as far as, as, far as getting ready for that last breath, whether it be over a period of time or a sudden death in a wreck or wherever, how God chooses to take you. Uh, Keeley's friend uh, had passed away. He was 26 years old. He was on a dock and a wave came and knocked him over. He drowned. He was a preacher boy. Another little baby we heard that had been died. It was a premature. It's twin lived, but it passed away. We don't know the hour in which we we're going to leave this world. But some prepare as close as they can and, and others don't prepare as much. Others just don't have the blessedness of being discipled, having access to people that care about them and teach them and show them and, and guide them. Tonight, uh, we are thankful for life. I'm thankful for life. And we must, we must learn to be more respectful of death. Don't live life so vicariously and so, uh, so flippantly that you don't prepare for that, that imminent time that's coming to all our lives. Death is certain for every one of us, no matter how young you all are and no matter how old you are. You can't cheat death. I want to preach about death and life tonight. My uncle just passed away in September. Although he lived uh, 87 years, 86 years, uh, it's never easy for us as loved ones to say goodbye. You think of uh, Aunt Frances has to live with the fact there's an empty space. Think of the children and the relatives and the friends that uh, when, when around the holidays you think, well, Robert's not here anymore. We've all been acquainted with death in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't make it any easier. But death always, it does always create the concern within people about eternity. At least in, in, in what I've seen in my life, every funeral I've preached, every time I've been acquainted with death, everybody's thinking at that particular moment about eternity. About what lies in eternity. And there's only two places that lie in eternity. That's heaven for those that are born again. And that's hell for those that are not. It's heaven for those that prepared and it's hell for those that did not. So where is Uncle Robert tonight? If he truly accepted Jesus Christ as his personal heaven, I, as his personal Savior, he's in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? If not, uh, if he was just a religious reader of the Scripture and he never humbled himself to be saved, he'd be in hell. I like to think that he accepted Christ based on what she said, based on the decision she, he made. But nobody really knows but you and God. And so uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's healthy to, to speculate if he had some evidence after he's gone to say, well, he's in, he's in heaven or in hell. We just need to take the truths that we know about it and make sure that we apply it to our life and make sure if he did some good things, we follow after those footsteps. He didn't, we, we don't make those same mistakes. One thing I said I'd get back to is that, and you gave me permission, that is that when, when he got hurt in church or because of the church thing, it, it knocked him out of being in church regularly, is that right? Regularly, y'all did attend church and things, but he never, he never got that, uh, not, he got back in that fellowship. And, and I, I, think, I think we would, um, uh, if he were to speak to us tonight, he would say stay in church. His death ought to make us think of eternity. Are you ready for it? It's, it's just one breath away. It's just the vapor. Are you ready to turn from your belief system uh, of self and turn to a, the, the system that God has laid out called faith? Are you ready to believe in what Christ has done for you on the cross? Uh, not believing in the biblical teaching, but believing in the biblical teacher. 
You realize there's a difference today. And those watching, I want you to understand there's a lot of people that live their life a good Christian-like life by believing in living by biblical teaching, but they never truly trust the biblical teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. They never really take Him as their personal Savior and as their Lord to where they talk with Him and walk with Him and, and they're guided by Him and their decisions or they're convicted by Him. They love Him. Jesus wants us all to be truly saved from our sins with desires of growth and desires to love one another, desires to, to do more than just live an empty life about self. In John chapter 11, I want you to look down in verse 25 and 26. It says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. A very important question, believest thou this? For life to have real meaning and purpose, one must be truly born again. One must truly know who Jesus Christ is in their life. Young people, I want you to pay close attention because most young people make professions. They make several professions, if not many. And so a lot of you might be writing on that, well, I got saved when I was this age, but nothing's really changed. You really didn't understand. Tonight may be the night that you truly get born again. I look at Fabiola. Fabiola made profession when she was real young. She, she, she didn't get saved. She, she was, went wayward, sway, went out a little bit, and then come back and truly got born again. You don't think you're going to heaven just because you believe. Just because you believe. The devils believe and they tremble. For life to have real meaning and purpose, you must be truly born again. To be saved, one must believe that you are dead in your sins. In, the, in Ephesians chapter 2, do you know what that means, being dead in your sins? That your sin in your life has killed you. That life is nothing because of your sin. Your sin has a hold on you, has a grip on you, and you know where it's chained to? It's called hell. Uh, let me make it very clear. God don't send anybody to hell. God loves us too much. Your sin and rejection of Him sends you to hell. In Ephesians chapter 2, it clarifies this thought of being dead in your sins. It says, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So there's a distinction made that Paul made to the church of Ephesus, saying that we were dead in our sins, but you know what? God made you alive. How did he do that? He talks about wherein in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we have all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh and of mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But verse 4 changes. He's describing that we're lost at one point. We were dead in our sins. But verse 4, he says, but God. And I like it in the Bible when it, when. A statement is made that's not very fun, not very good, it's not very uh, uh, pleasing, but then it says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, you're saved. So salvation eludes, it escapes many simply because they never see themselves as needing to be saved. A lot of young people have their eyes so focused. A lot of older people as well, they're so focused on things and material and popularity that salvation being so simple and free, it eludes many because they never see themselves needing anything. I'm a good person. I, I'm not that bad. I think what I'm doing is okay. These are those that have religion. And you can shrug it off. You can, you can slough it off. You can do whatever you want. But when you die, you're going to go to hell. Not because God wants you to, but because you reject truth. You can't hold on to this world and to sin and think you're going to take it to heaven. Luke 5, 31 says, And Jesus answering them, saying, and said unto them, They that are, uh, they that are whole need not a physician, but, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So how do, you, how do you know you go to heaven when you die? Well, first you've got to understand that you're, we are dead in our sins and our trespasses. We've got to realize we need a Savior. I need a physician. You do too. Sin is killing us. 
It is what has killed everyone except Jesus. His death came from a broken heart. And one must believe they need the resurrection and they need the life of Christ. It's someone that's dead that I know you think, well, how can you even fathom being dead and, and saying you're, you're thinking about needing life? Well, you have the ability to think right now you're dead and you're, you're in your sins. You're dead and in your sins. Why not thinking I need the life of Christ? I need the resurrection and the life. At Christ's death, it's too, or at your death, it's too late to make this declaration. But it's not too late right now. You're still alive. You're breathing. You can make that declaration. Lord, I'm dead in my sins and my trespasses. Uh, sin is ever before me. I'm, I'm a sinner needing salvation. Do you believe you're a sinner? Are you really believing that you're dead in your sins? Meaning that you can't do nothing. You're, you're trapped by them. You're controlled by them. As a dead sinner, you admit that you need Jesus. You need his resurrection. You need his resurrection life. Romans 3.23 says, says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You admit that. That's the start of, of getting saved, truly going to heaven when you die. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are, they are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. You know what Christ is saying? He's telling us that there's nothing we can do in this flesh that can save us, that can purify us. The only thing that we can do is to accept the death and burial and resurrection, the life of Christ in our life in order to go to heaven. So that's the second point. We must believe that we're dead in our sins, but we also must believe in his life, that he is life, that he's just not a name. He's a name above all other names. At the name of Jesus, everyone should bow. At the very name, there's not a name given among men whereby we must be saved. It's at the name of Jesus. It's, it's Jesus, his life. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said in there, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I want you to see, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The world's definition of life is me, 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 me. That's my life. My life isn't good unless it's all about me. But the true definition is God. It's Jesus and it's the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's what overrides me and that's what overrides. That's what quickens us. That's what makes us alive. That's what makes life worth living. Do you know when you stay in your sin, there's pleasure but for a season and there's always consequence. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh is I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Many take religious postures. Uh, they, they, take, they, they want to look religious. They get them a Bible. They, they get church clothes maybe. They find a church they get they they posture as a as a Christian. They they have a they have a title, but they they lack a testimony. Many take a religious posture and never never take the life of Christ. What does it mean to take his life? His life was one of sacrifice. His life was one of love. He came to give. He was crucified, buried, and he rose the third day. So in order for us to be saved and go to heaven, we must understand that we're dead and our trespasses and sins, and we've got to accept his life. What is his, what is his life? What does that mean by accepting it? That he died for us so that we would live for him. Amen. Salvation means that you have taken his life. I remember when I accepted Christ. Before I had made professions. And some of you, can I get a raise of hands? How many of y'all made professions before you got saved? You made a profession before you got saved? Most everybody does. You make professions. And we're trying to make sure that you just don't have a profession, but you have a true salvation. Salvation means you've taken his life, that he's more to you than just a name. Galatians 5.16 explains this. It says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that they cannot do the things that you would. 
But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, and lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, strife, uh, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's pretty straightforward. Some of you folks in here are maybe listening and watching. Some of you young people might be struggling, thinking I can live like hell and do whatever I want to. And because I got saved and preacher Chris baptized me, I'm going to heaven when I die. If you think that way, young lady, young sir, you don't have salvation. You have a profession. And then verse 22, again, Paul addresses the church of Galatia. And he puts some, uh, some pretty tough statements there. But then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So we have to take His life. We accept that He died for us. We accept that He rose for us. Eternal death, listen to me, eternal death. It's not about you die and go to hell and you party with friends. You die and go to hell and you just live in a, in, in a hot, hot room. This is an outer darkness. It's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a very dark regret for all eternity and never ends. You think some of my sermons are long, wait to hell. Amen. And in hell, you'll remember every sermon I ever preached to your ears and every time I pleaded for you to repent and get saved. Eternal death is avoided after you admit that you're a sinner and believe in his life. And then one last thing, you have to do one more thing, except you accept it through the change in your life. You know you've accepted him through the change. John eleven twenty six 26 says, and whoso liveth and believeth. First time I, I picked on, up on this, I've preached this uh, on many occasions. But it says, but whoso, and, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? It says, whoso liveth and believeth. It means that there is an acceptance of change in their life. It means that in Romans 10, 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Hey, this salvation that people are getting these this day and age, where they pray a prayer, they cry a tear, and they go back right to the home and live like hell. There's no change. There's no difference. There's no desire. There's no conviction. There's You didn't take God's life. God's life. There wasn't an acceptance of change. You see, that acceptance of change means it's a repentance attitude. You turn, believing has intertwined with it that I, I believe, believe us how this, I believe now no longer on myself, no longer on what I think is right, but I repent and turn and believe that I'm dead in my trespasses and sin. I believe that Jesus is, is life and I take his life and I accept it through the change in my life. Death is hard to handle when you, when you think when, when life is over, when you think about uh, Robert's gone and Dad's gone and Farrell's gone and so many, it's hard to handle sometimes. But when you get saved, death is only a doorway to a new life to Jesus. It doesn't mean you don't cry, Aunt Fred's cry. It doesn't mean you don't mourn. It doesn't mean you don't grieve. That song tears me up every time I hear it. And let me tell you this, parents, I, I talk to the teenagers because I see them every Sunday. I'm concerned for some of them, for some of them. They don't, they don't think about death. You didn't either. I didn't either. You just think, let me live it up. And, and you toss away the truth for a lie. What a day that will be when Jesus I shall see. What a day that will be because I've accepted that change in my life. As I said, Robert was a deacon in, in his younger life. But things caused him to get him out of attending the church on a regular basis. He did read the Bible regularly. He was a very nice man. If he could speak today, I think he most certainly would say, listen to that preacher. Amen. Aunt Francis gave me a, 
told me of a compliment that Robert, Robert uh, had for me. He said that, that I was the best preacher that he, that he heard. I believe he'd say, listen. I believe he'd say, get saved. I believe he'd say, walk with God. I believe he'd say, Jesus is worthy. I believe he'd say this, don't let anything or anyone keep you from serving the Lord in the days that you have left. I believe that's what Robert would say. But I believe Jesus said it in the book when he said, believe us now this. Do you believe that Jesus died? Do you believe you're a sinner? Do you believe you need a Savior? Do, do you want to change? Is there a change? Do you want to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty and, and, quit, and quit lying to yourself that everything's okay and really get, get right with the Lord? Do you really? For when I preach your funeral, if God gives me that liberty, what would I say about your life? What could I say? Or what would others say about your life? We know the scripture says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's a sobering, sombering time to think that my Uncle Robert's right there. His body's right there. And if he accepted Christ as his Savior, as, as, she, as Aunt Francis said he did as a young man, he's in heaven. His soul's in heaven. But what about us? A funeral, a memorial service is the, a lot of times the only time that people we get so serious, and we need to get serious, don't we? About eternity. It's no joke. We're seeing it very quickly come to pass that these are the last days. And men are waxing worse and worse and worse. And we need to trust the Lord Jesus as Savior. I conclude with these three words, four words. It is your choice. Would you please stand? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, Over the years, many people would ask me, Preacher, do you believe our loved ones can look out in, can look out from heaven and look down in here? I think they can. I think I don't, if they do, I don't know if they do. But, but at times like this, I think at least in our carnal mind today, we say, man, if it was my funeral, my memorial, I'd be looking out and seeing what people would do. Your loved ones in heaven, your loved ones in hell, where would you want to go when you die? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anybody here this evening that would say, Preacher Chris, I'm not certain I'm saved. I, I, I'm, I, I'm fearful of my, my position in eternity. I, I don't know if I, if I were to die, I'd go to, I'd go to heaven. I, I need to pray with somebody. Would somebody come talk to me? Would you slip your hand up? Anybody? Anybody in here? Is there anybody to say, Preacher Chris, I, I, I'm, I saved, I made a profession, I've, I believe I go to heaven, but I do, need, I do need to work on my testimony. I've got the title, I need to get my testimony right. I just hadn't got it all together. I, God bless you, I see your hands, yes. Your testimony. a song that was requested that we know so well. It's the only way that we're going to heaven is because of the amazing grace of our Lord. Grace is God's unmerited favor for you and I. And, and I read this uh, just recently. I think Oswald Chambers said it. It really struck me as an as a interesting thought is that a lot of people think they're going to heaven just because God loves them. That sounds right, right? I'm going to heaven because God loves me. Brother Chambers drew a, a stark line and he said, you know, God loves us, yes. But we're going to heaven because of Calvary. 
because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You see, if Jesus didn't shed His blood, if Jesus didn't die for our sins, He could still love us and we could still go to hell. But because He came to this earth and He lived 33 and a half years and He was mocked and bruised and beaten and crucified, shed His blood for you and I, that 2,000 years later we can be in a a Bible-believing church and say, Lord, I need you tonight. And I thank you for amazing grace and accept you as Savior. You can be in this church tonight and say, Lord, I, I'm falling short and I need a better testimony. Would you help me tonight? You can be here tonight and say, Lord, I need comforting. I'm sad over certain situations. Lord, help me. You can be in a church tonight and say, God, I'm bitter about being I'm mad at somebody or, or I've done something wrong. Forgive me. That's amazing grace. Let's sing it. Amazing grace, how sweet that saved I I once was lost. Listen to this last verse. to remind you again, you don't need to be in church to get saved. You don't need to have a preacher talking to you to be saved. You just need to get saved when you, when you sense the Spirit of God dealing with you. The Spirit of God may deal with you as you're walking out the door. He may deal with you tonight. He may deal with you as you're going to the restroom. He may, I don't know. He may deal with you while you're eating, eating across the street. But all I can plead with you is say, let God deal with you. And just say, Lord, I need you. How many of y'all regret getting saved? And something I heard after the service today was, how did it go about looking at Calvary? What was it? Where is it? Yeah, what kind of person are you if you look at Calvary and say, I want more? What kind of person? Where are you at? Spoiled. Spoiled. Man, we've, God's blessed us. We're, we, are, we are in a blessed place. And uh, salvation's free. And I'm glad that, uh, Aunt Francis, that we as a church can try to be some comfort to you. And I know it's hard not having any other family than at least you got the best sister with you, right? Amen. Uh, no, I, Aunt Lois, and uh, yeah, we, we do love you, and uh, we want want Holy Ghost just to love up on you in these days, and and uh, I look forward to I look forward to heaven. Did you know what? There's it's Christmas time in heaven. Twenty, I mean, forever and ever, Christmas time, joy, wonderful, and we don't have to open up presents or wrap them. Say amen there. So we, we love you, Aunt Francis, and we want you to, to know from our church and, and, and our family, and I thank you for coming. I know uh, uh, some of you don't know my aunt, but uh, uh, it's never easy saying goodbye to your, your love of your life for 36 years. And so you pray for her um, in the days to come. I know she'd appreciate it. Uh, when we exit, if you have an offering, the guys are in the back. Uh, and let me let me be extremely. I I don't Tuesday to be screaming. I don't want any kids, little kids, going across that street by themselves. 